Support for this season of Stereophonic comes from Universal Audio, pioneering audio recording for more than 60 years. Find out more at uaudio.com. And from Perlman Microphones, making tube microphones in the classic style. Find out more at perlmanmicrophones.com. Welcome to the digital airways of Stereophonic, an ongoing conversation series presenting the people, personalities, and perspectives of the modern music business. I'm Dan Kimpel. With our fourth season, we continue to introduce you to those in the spotlight and behind the scenes, and all of our Stereophonic subjects are right here with us in person. It is our objective to entertain and inform you as we reveal tips and tales from deep inside the music industry. Three consecutive Grammy Awards for Best Score Soundtrack and three consecutive Tech Awards for Best Film Sound Production. John Kurlander is an illustrious balance engineer and remixer whose career began with Abbey Road by the Beatles. Since then, he's worked on musical cast albums, orchestral recordings and films, including the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and numerous Academy Award winning and Oscar nominated projects. A lot of great music is made really quickly. And I would say that if you're at home mixing something and it, it's taking too long, and you think you're getting closer to it, you're probably not. And sometimes you should just switch off and come back to it fresh another time and see if you can be a bit more spontaneous. Meet a master sonic craftsman of the highest order. We're in studio with a gentleman who is no stranger to the studio, John Kurlander, known to us as a balance engineer, recording yes. engineer, mix engineer. Call it what you a will. A man whose career has stretched from Rock and roll, pop music, classical music, film music, game music. I'm leaving something out. And he's just returned to us where he was at the Latin Grammy Awards in Las Vegas. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. And you were nominated for a Latin Grammy we, we were. Me and my uh, friend were, were nominated, but we didn't win. <laughs> so there you go. Can't, can't get everything. So we add Latin music to your, uh, to your repertoire. I guess so, yes. Very yeah. cool. Yes. Very cool. It was great putting together uh, things to listen to in preparation for this interview today. I got right. to, to revisit some things. I got oh, really? to explore some new things right. and got to see there's some connections between you and guests that we've had previously. Oh. Uh, one is a composer named Christopher Tin. Oh, uh, sure. You had Chris on the show? Yes, we did. Right. Yes, we did. Fairly early on. And yeah. uh, you worked with Christopher. I know. Oh, on his first solo. Yeah. yeah. And Baba Yetu. Right? Yes. Yeah, great. Great. And uh, we've also had engineers... From the engineering world like Al Schmidt, sure. uh, Rest of Soed, Cherney, mm -hmm. um, and Rafa Sardina, who we were yeah, discussing. Right. And, yeah. Al so, and I collaborated on, uh, I did the orchestra tracks on Toto. Yes, you did. And that was some uh, part of my listening, too. So we'll be getting to all oh, of cool. those things, John Kurlander, as we move forward. I wanted to ask you about something that our friends at Universal Audio made us aware of, which is the Heritage Projects with Frank Sinatra and mm -hmm. with Nat King Cole. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I've just recently been involved in um, some of the preparation work for the um, Universal Atmos project that's currently rolling out. And I'd done a few tracks of Nat King Cole, which sounded absolutely amazing. I called up the guys at Universal who sent me stuff, and I said, almost jokingly, well, send me the Sinatra then, because <laughs> that's the jewel in the crown. Yeah. And they said, sure, of course we will. So they sent me a whole album of Nice and Easy to work on. And I, I listened to it. It's just three tracks. And there's absolutely no way that the reverb on the originals was anything other than Capital Chambers. It was just a no-brainer. So I contacted Universal through a friend. friend. Sorry, Universal Audio. Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. UAD. And said, let's try the new plugin on this. And I played around with it and I went in and out of the presets and I did actually find a very good, I'd say a 99% match to what was on the original uh, stereo release. Obviously I trained and grew up and spent half my life at Abbey Road where you know everyone refers to the 60s as one of our golden eras there. 
But I have to say that the stuff that Capitol Studios did in the 50s has got to be some of the best recorded music I've ever heard. Their technique of recording is just so simple, so straightforward, and it stands up now. I mean, we were doing these things, and it's good quality. It's clean, it's quiet, and the balance is just impeccable. So it was just a, a sheer joy to listen to the stuff that basically is just one generation from the original tape, just the original tape having been digitized at 192K, not bad. And so that was a great thrill. I hope they'll be doing some more of it. People talk about Frank Sinatra's voice uh, in terms of his mic technique. Yeah. He understood how to come back and go yes, forward yeah. in crescendos and that very little had to be done there. Mm. And he typically, as I understand, did not belabor the amount of vocal takes. No. I mean, while I was doing this, I, I kind of jumped on YouTube to see what I could find. And I saw a session video of him doing a song. I can't remember what it was right now. And it starts off with him just rehearsing it with the orchestra without it being recorded. And he was just going through. And he was really just marking it, not doing it. And I thought, okay, well, it doesn't really sound like Frank. You know, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. And then he says, okay, let's go for a take. And he switches on the sound. And then he, he goes and gets the proximity on the mic. You know, And there was the sound on take one. But when you hear him just like noodling along and rehearsing, it wasn't there. There was nothing there at all. So that was really interesting. And then you get to, to hear the files, which nothing been done to it. And you think, yes, it's, it's what you said. It's all about mic technique. And he's, he's performing to the microphone. He just knew how to do that. I'm interested in your perception of physical space to record in. Mm. Um, I read an interview with you where I believe the to paraphrase you were talking about in England, you know, spaces can be big and stone and brick and in Southern California mm. for obvious reasons. We don't have spaces that are necessarily like that. Yeah. So especially with your classical music or with the West End musicals that you did, mm -hmm. I would imagine that the physical space was, was a big part of, of the sound or not. I could get incredibly <laughs> boring on this. When I'm working in a new place, I do actually study the architecture and the construction of the room. You know, not, not just what's stuck on the walls, you know, not what the floor is made of, but what's under. I, you know, you look at a floor and say, oh, that's a very nice floor. But actually, they've painted it with a polyurethane something plastic. So it's not really a wooden floor. It's a plastic floor. And then, like, well, what's under the floor. And I was recording it in, in one studio, and I found out that the subfloor underneath was all completely different levels. At one point, it was about a foot under the surface. At another point, it was 10 foot void. under. And when you started putting instruments with resonance on, like a bass drum or timp or a drum kit, it made a real difference where you put it in the room, because what was going to resonate under the floor. So that's a like very, very intense kind of discussion. But then you also get to the thing like when I moved over to Los Angeles area, the rooms sound different here and they couldn't be as big. I mean, you could take Sony or Fox or Warner Brothers and they, they're a comparable size to what we have in Europe. You know, you can't have a brick and concrete wall that's six foot and mass. So the bass response is going to be completely different. And it's something that I find you really have to deal with. I'm not saying the bass response is better or worse. It just doesn't have the same characteristics. Because, oh, you know, we could go to Europe and we're called in these churches. I say, we've got churches in, the, in California. Yeah, but they're not, you know, it's not the same. So I, I do actually think that, you know, the materials and the, the density of the materials are going to make a, a big difference on the sound beyond what they're covered in. On my playlist, I had uh, Sir Brightman, uh, Pierre Jesu. Oh, yeah. You know, and I know you worked on that. And, and, and I was very aware of the ambience of sound. Yes. How was that recorded? 
That was the Andrew Lloyd Webber Requiem. Yes. Yes. Uh, that was just, uh, it was recorded in Studio One, mid-80s, landscape. Well, it, Studio One is actually one of the very few studios, maybe the only studio I know, where you can set it up in two different orientations, either what we call um, portrait or landscape. And they have quite different characteristics, so you've got to choose which way you're going to record. Yeah, so that was recorded in landscape mode, all together live, the, the, the strings, I mean the orchestra, the choir, and the soloists, all in one hit. <laughs> <laughs> um, There's a concept. Sometimes, John, uh, in our, our music world, projects get bigger in a historical perspective than they seem at, at the moment. Um, Always. <laughs> Always. <laughs> And um, I went back and listened to Odyssey and Oracle by, by the Zombies, right? Which I understand is a part of your history that you one very of the, early part, very of early part, of first year. Yes, what a great sounding record that is! I know. It's very out yeah. there, and it, it sounds like the Beach Boys at certain times, where it's got vocal yes. arranging yeah. like that. Time of the season being the That's song right. that yeah. was the best known, and then there's a whole lot of mythology around that project, the yes. intentional or non-intentional misspelling of Odyssey or, you know, Al Cooper's involvement in bringing it to attention in the United States. What do you remember? About Actually, I, to be honest, I don't. <laughs> I, I mean, I know that I worked on it. Jeff Emmerich yes. engineered. And it was my first year. I started at Everett when I was 16. So I worked with Jeff definitely on the mixing of the album. Maybe I did some of the sessions. I really don't I really don't remember. But I think that working with Jeff and assisting him on that was definitely what led to the invitation early in 69 for him to ask me to assist him with the Beatles. So that's kind of my main thing. Oh yeah, Odyssey and Oracle or something. Led to the Beatles. That's, yeah, right. That's very cool. Yeah. I think it was interesting to read that Abbey Road didn't necessarily want to hire people that had experience. They wanted to hire people that didn't have experience. Is that correct? Yeah. All the new kids who got invited for interviews were 16. At that time in England, there was an option to leave school at 16 or stay on for another two years and study at A-levels, which would lead to university. But if you didn't want to go that route, you could leave at 16. And when I was 16, in September, the beginning of the new semester, I wrote to a whole bunch of studios. BBC, I said, there were a lot of studios in London at the time. Decca, EMI. And EMI wrote back to me immediately and said, come for an interview. And this was like the first week of September. And I went to the interview. It was ridiculously easy. I mean, it was like 10 minute chat followed two days later by a job offer. So I went back to school. I was a local kid. I lived around the corner. And my school was around the other corner. So we were all very local. And I went back to uh, my head teacher and I said, they offered me a job. So he said, are you going to take it? I said, yeah. So I left school and I started there as basically a runner, which was basically you go, they, they, the first job they gave you was to be in the tape library, which was very clever, actually, because you got to know how the tape systems work, you, you know, the labeling and the thing. And then you'd be a runner, and they say, go down to Studio 2 or Studio 3 and deliver these tapes. And if it's interesting and you're not in the way, just, you know, hang around. If they, you know, if they throw you out, it doesn't matter. So I was in the tape library for three months uh, doing this, running tapes backwards and forwards. And then after three months, I got called in and said, when we come back from the Christmas break, you're not going to be in the library anymore. You're going to be down on the studio floor. So anyway, so I was doing that. It was the beginning of 68. And I'd been there about six months. And I came out of the studio on, one day after a session. And my head teacher from the school was walking past and he did like a little chat, you know, how are you getting on? And blah, blah, blah. I wanted to know how I was doing. And so I told him, and I, you know, chatted for about five minutes in the street. And he said, well, I'm really pleased to hear that. So tell Gus Cook, I said, hello. 
Gus Cook happened to be the assistant manager. And I turned him around, I said, hang on a sec, how do you know Gus Cook? And he said, he's my next door neighbor. And his wife and my wife are best of friends. Go figure. <laughs> Could be an inside gig. There you That's go. That's great. That's there great. You go. But the amazing thing about that whole story is all the time that I was uh, saying I wanted a right to studios, he didn't say anything. And all the time that I told him, they offered me a job and I'm going to take it, he didn't say anything. Nice. Very nice. Very, very classy. John Curlander seems to have worked out pretty well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So St. John's Wood, that was an exotic sounding place to us here in the States. We, we learned about it from the Rolling Stones song, Play With Fire, mm. a block in St. John's Wood. Oh, that sounds really exotic. Sometimes when I interview people of our generation mm -hmm. uh, who grew up in the UK, they talk about the post-World War II vibe where America looked like this incredible, flashy, Jane Mansfield, drive a Cadillac, live in California, wonderland. Yeah. And, and they were coming back from kind of the, into this kind of post-war kind of drab economic place. I mean, did American music, was that something that opened doors for you? Or? Yes. Yeah. 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 And I mean, you've only got to look at, I'm talking to you here in San Fernando Valley all these years later. I mean, so many people from London wanted to come here. You know, Jeff Emmerich was here. Ken Scott was here. Even uh, also on the Beatles' film, McDonald, he's not, he, he went to New York. But a lot of the people just had this thing, oh, we want to, to be in America. And we listened to American music. And I have to tell this story because, I mean, it's against me. One night on the Abbey Road album, it was maybe about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I was sitting by the machine, and it had been a very, very long night. And maybe I was looking a little down. And Paul came up to me and started just having a little conversation about small talk, nothing. So he said, well, what's your favorite album? And I don't know, in retrospect, I thought, well, maybe I should say Revolver or maybe Sergeant Pepper. Without even thinking, I said Pet Sounds. And like now I'm thinking, how could you possibly say that? It kind of saved the day because he actually loved Pet Sounds. I don't know that you can compare it to Sgt. Pepper, but it was out at the same time. And for this, I was 18, an 18 year old kid, just to say, without even thinking, to Mr. McCartney. Yeah, Pet Sounds probably my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so to answer your question, yes. yes, it was very, you know, the Cadillacs and the burgers and the. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, I understand. We get to hear different versions of Abbey Road. We get yeah. to hear, hear the demo of something, which is incredible to hear. Um, just, just different things. My first question about Abbey Road or the recording of it would be, did having Yoko Ono in a bed in the studio enhance or influence the sound in any way? <laughs> <laughs> no, it didn't. But I mean, I think it was unavoidable. They wanted to do the album. They wanted to be together. They wanted to, they wanted to make nice and be friendly, and she just had this car accident. Yeah. John was not going to leave her at home. And if he did leave her at home, it would have just caused more problems. So I'll tell you what the problem with the bed was. It wasn't her being in the bed. It was the constant inflow, influx of visitors. She didn't have prescribed visiting hours. People would come and leave and sit by her bedside whenever they wanted to come. So the disturbance of the bed was not her or her condition. It was a constant coming and going of her friends. <laughs> and of course, their friends had come to talk to her. And the guys at the other end of the room were trying to make music. So I think, I think that's what it was. Plus the fact that not all of the sessions were in Studio 2. Most of them were, but the Beatles had to book studios like anybody else. And if they needed more time and the studios weren't available, they'd move from Studio 3 to Studio 2. So, you know, at the end of the night, if the next day we were going to be in Studio 3, which is upstairs, we had to move all the mics and reset up the mics. The roadies had to move all the instruments, not just the instruments that were like, not just one amp or one guitar, but all the guitars, you know, the whole game, and the bed. And, of course, remake the bed. <laughs> <laughs> 
fresh shoots every day. So, you know, everyone had an opinion from their own point of view. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so great to, to strip the mythology away sometimes and just yeah. to, to hear the demos and just realize it's just it's four guys playing music. Yeah, right. And, you know, and it, it's rough sounding and yeah. you hear reference vocals. The one thing that I'm still in total disbelief of and shock that, I mean, although I realized this was like an important gig at the time and you don't want to do anything to screw it up, but I never, ever imagined that we'd be sitting here on a 50th anniversary that people would even remember it. And, you know, I was just back at, in London last week at Abbey Road and, you know, the tourist industry, you know, Abbey Road Crossing is now probably on par with Buckingham Palace and, you know, the Houses of Parliament as the number one tourist attraction. And, you know, back in 69, I just would never have believed that. I found that's a kind of a through line from people that created music in a certain time. They saw that music in its time and then they went on to the next project. Yes. Interesting to see how that, that has worked out. <laughs> yeah, I know. we had interviewed Brian Kehue, who uh, sure. you know co-wrote the book "Recording the Beatles" and fifteen-year project of research to find all of that minutia and all of those details. That people are fascinated how those sounds were made. You've made the point in the past that the Beatles were about moving forward. Yes, you know, so veneration of the past, interesting as that may be, is not really not something they were into at all. Yeah. No. Yeah, I, I have said that, and I do. All my memories are, are based on things being, you know, they wanted each album to be better and sound better than the one before. And even when they finished a track, they wanted the next song to be better than the previous track. So it was everything was done that the whole on Abbey Road, the whole acceptance of us having a brand new solid state desk and moving up from four track to eight track, double the capacity. How many artists, I don't want to denigrate anybody, but how many artists have a huge hit and then they go into a sense of panic of how am I going to follow up this huge hit? So they write a follow-up song that is basically the same chord sequence, the same tempo, because they're terrified yeah. of not being able to follow it up. And that is the absolute opposite of what the Beatles did. They never looked backwards at anything. And musically, technically, that they, they never ever said, oh, why don't we have um, this guitar sound that was on Revolver? How did we, do, you know, has anyone got the notes of Revolver? How did we do that? You know, not interested. There's a piece of mythology that uh, maybe you could share with us, but it has to do with um, something that was cut piece of tape <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah that was that you located and, yes uh, can you so, tell us that? so what that was was the the medley on side two as it was for months working on the album i never realized that it was anything more than a collection of short songs nobody told that i was literally working there on a need to know basis right and um so as far as i was concerned this song is one minute long this is a minute and a half why are we doing this, you know? And then one afternoon, we had an afternoon evening session. All sessions started at lunchtime. I said, right, we're going to take all these short songs, we're going to do a rough mix of all of them, and then tonight we're going to join them together. And Paul here <laughs> has the running order. Honestly, that was the, to my memory, that was the first I'd ever heard of it. And I thought, okay, that makes sense. So we did that, it took about four or five hours to do the rough, and they were rough mixes. But, you know, the, some of the stuff was overdubbed after that point. But we did that, and then uh, we set up three machines in order to do crossfades, because they weren't hard joins. They, were, they would be crossfaded joins. And you'd re to do a crossfade, you'd manually start the second machine while the first machine was still running to get an overlap. And so the overlaps were on third machine. So to put, put it together, you'd take song one, then... A, little like three seconds of a crossfade and then song two and then another crossfade. And at about well after midnight, maybe one or two in the morning, we had this medley that was Paul's running order. And then I, I began to understand what all these short songs 
were and why. And we played it through. And uh, I'm sure George was George Martin was there, but Paul was the only Beatle there at that time. Because by that time, it was just an editing situation. Was I was doing, I was, I did 90% of the tape editing. You know, if Jeff Emmerich didn't trust me to do an edit, he would say, oh, no, let me do this one. But most of the time, I would do all the tape editing. And we played it through, and it was great. And then Paul said, yeah, just take Her Majesty's and cut it out, check it out. And he left. And um, I, th I don't remember. I think George Martin left as well. It was just me and Jeff Emmerich to kind of tidy up, do the housekeeping. And this 20 seconds of Her Majesty was on the floor. So I wasn't going to leave it on the floor. And what I should have done is I, I should have put it back on the reel that it came from, which was the rough mix of the songs. And that involved a lot of spooling. And you have to understand that in those days, spooling was not a totally safe activity, especially at three o'clock in the morning, because we used open flange tape. And the th if you went carelessly too fast, it could spin off and destroy itself, which is something you don't want to do on a Beatles session. <laughs> so, so I thought, OK, there's things on the floor. Number one, I'm not going to throw it away. Number two, I really don't feel like putting it back on the E-tape, the work tape where it came from. So there is a procedure, I remember, that if you remove something from a master, you can put it at the end of the reel after a long gap of red leader and just call it like an outtake or not required. I'll do that. This is now a master. Well, it wasn't a master. It was a rough mix assembly. But I said, no, I'll call it a master and I'll use the, that procedure. So... I did that and I stuck it at the end and I actually thought Her Majesty track at the end after 15 seconds of leader. What I didn't write on it is don't use it. <laughs> I just said Her Majesty's at the end after the gap. So then uh, Mal Evans, who's their roadie, main principal roadie, signed for the tape and he took it to Apple the next morning where Malcolm Davis cut a reference. And Malcolm looked at this and he said, well, John left it on, I'll leave it on. <laughs> So the lacquer came back at lunchtime the next day and all the Beatles and George Martin were there and said, let's have a little concert and play through this thing. And I mean, I had no idea that Malcolm had left it on as well. Uh, anyway, they play it and it gets to the end and the love you give is, love you make is equal to the love you take. Heavenly, angelic ending. And everyone in the room just, you know, there's this silence of, that's the end of, what might be our last album. And they're all just digesting and taking in that experience. And this <laughs> crashing chord comes in. And they're all like, <laughs> and I don't, I can't remember, but I mean, it was, you know, a mixture of WTF and McCartney is saying, no, it's cool. I like it. Leave it. Now, here's the thing that's, that's interesting. They would record a lot of material. A lot. They, every song they did, they would, record maybe multiple times and maybe do two two hours worth of recording and then um, either choose a take or say, no, we'll do it again tomorrow or next week, next month, maybe faster, slower, different key, and, and really go on until they got exactly what they were looking for. But at the same time they were doing that, they'd also accept random mistakes like the hum entities, like other things that just happen by serendipity. And they, they buy into that just as easily as they would labor away and, and record songs multiple times. So that's one of them. Thank you for, thank you for, <laughs> for sharing that. <laughs> that's why we hear it the way we hear it. Even though it was a rough mix mm -hmm. of the thing panning from one side to the other, they didn't even want to remix it again. That's, <laughs> or try and recreate the crossfade. I just took it as it was, as one of those things that maybe, yeah, maybe Paul thought it was meant to be. Your emergence into the world of film, you know, working with Howard Shore, and sure. Beltrami, composers on, on that level, was that a conscious thought about moving away from doing pop music or doing rock music? No, I mean, I've always felt, you know, I wanted to have a lot of eggs in different baskets. 
And, you know, I also, you know, in the late 80s, from late well, 1980s to 95, had a lot of legitimate classical yes. like for EMI classics. And I think that my classical work was what attracted Howard to want me to work with him. Um, the first, uh, well, the first film that I did with him was a, a Cronenberg movie called M Butterfly. Which was based yes. on Madame Butterfly, based on Puccini. So Howard wrote a very Puccini. So he thought, oh yeah, I'll have one of Abbey Road's classical engineers to do that. And then the second film I did with him was Philadelphia with Tom Hanks. And I thought, well, which, you know, was a big like award-winning film. And I thought, this is good. At the same time, the 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 classical music recording was beginning to slow down a bit. At EMI, we'd had a contract, for instance, with the Philadelphia Orchestra that ran for 15 years. And in 95, they said, OK, we're not going to renew that. And a lot of other long-term contracts, even with the Berlin Philharmonic, were not being renewed. And at that time, I'd been, you know, I just did an award-winning movie with Howard Shaw. Maybe I'll move sideways. And, you know, the fact that he, he enjoyed it being recorded by somebody with a classical background didn't you know didn't do any harm so that's how that happened and you know it was at that point I'd been at Abbey Road for coming up to 30 years so I kind of felt well maybe this is time to move sideways 6,000 miles sideways <laughs> um and it wasn't no it wasn't easy you know um, and, you know, it kind of, it kind of worked out. You talk about, it's interesting you reference classical music because there are people who feel that film music is in a lot of ways sort of like a new version of classical music. And when I, I see, um, like the ring, you worked on the ring trilogy and there are, there are live performances of, mm. of that music now being yeah. done, which, which with choirs and orchestras, which is very interesting. Mm. I'm going to quote Howard Shore on because he was a big classical music fan. And also, I mean, he was a jazz musician. I mean, basically a jazz musician. But he loved classical music. And he, when he was talking specifically um, about Lord of the Rings, he was saying, the score I'm writing for Lord of the Rings is like an opera, except that you've got an orchestra and you've got a choir. But instead of the singers in the opera, the dialogue is, they are the performers. So you basically have the dialogue and the choir and the orchestra, and it's an opera. So he kind of explained it that way. And, you know, he said, yeah, the, even to do that, we then, ad I, with him, we adopted for Lord of the Rings, we, we took a setup that was based on the orchestra layout of the Met Opera in New York. And, he, you know, he said, the orchestra should sound like it's in the pit, you know, below you know, and then what you're seeing on stage are the actors. And so, yeah, there is, at that time, in terms of Lord of the Rings, that's how it was perceived. I wouldn't say that's true of like Fast and Furious. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's the whole thing. I think film music, every score is something different. And it, it kind of cuts across every genre. You know, you can have a jazz score. You can have a rock score. I mean, some some scores, you know, are, are so... And some, you know, a lot of films now are actually not even bothering with scores. They're just putting in rock tracks, you know, one after the other. Yeah. So, you know, it is, um, you know, film scoring is an accompaniment to the opera on stage. And you can accompany it really in any way you like. And I, I have to say that, you know, a lot of the composers that, that I, I work with and come across and met have this flexibility to, you know, oh, you know, he's an orchestral composer. Well, maybe not, because, yes. I mean, everyone talks about John Williams being a jazz musician. musician. So um, all the really, I think all the really good film composers are able to shift accordingly. A score that you worked on that I, I find of great interest, I loved the film and I loved the score, is uh, 310 to Yuma. Oh, yeah. Um, a James Mangold film, Marco Beltrami, mm -hmm. inventing instruments at some point. To, yeah. To, 
<laughs> as opposed to using conventional instruments. He sort of invented some. Right? Yeah. It's a very interesting concept. Yeah. To, to kind I, of I think, think that. that was, re- I mean, Buck Sanders was like really responsible for most of those things and just draw inspiration. You know, I don't know. They did one film where there was a lot of underwater action. So Buck bought a, I forget what it's called, hydro mic or something, kind of mic that will, will work underwater. And he'd put this mic underwater and those splashing things around. There's a lot of salesmanship <laughs> in that kind of thing. And some links are a bit more tenuous than others. But if I appreciate it in any way, I appreciate the salesmanship aspect of it. To say, yeah, we, we did this, yeah, you know. Sure. And, you know, we can do a thing about it. 310 to you, which is a train. So, you know, let's get a model train and chop it up <laughs> and hit it. <laughs> and it's the sound of a train. Um, and various other <laughs> things that are e- even more tenuous than that. That's a very cynical view. You know, I think that a lot of film score, you know, that you have to kind of search out for some. Again, I mean, going back to what I said about the Beatles, always looking for something new. And, you know, sample libraries are great, but they're available to everybody. So I think what what Buck and Marco was really trying to do is they say, we don't want to use uh, sounds that are available to everybody. We're going to make our own. And I think that's the, the, the real positive side of it. With the thought of everything should be new or or should sound new. Yes. Um, in dealing with film and with film composers, with that thought in mind, um, how does the temp track fit into that motif? Oh, well, <laughs> that's a real can of worms. It doesn't. I mean, that plays into the, it's a whole thing. I think it's a whole thing about the budgets of the film and the responsibility and of the, the, the feeling of needing uh, the security of not not taking too many chances with the music. It's two things. One, it's it's the um, the security it gives, saying, well, if we use this, then we'll probably be all right. And even if the film tanks or people hate it, you can say, well, we but we did base it on some, you know, the music. We weren't trying to reinvent the wheel when we did this. We were playing it. Sa- it's playing it safe, but. Let's let's not call it a temp track. Let's call it a demo. And as we all know, a lot of people in the music business, in the record business, have demos and they get demo love. And the more you hear it, the more you, you fall in love with it and you think this is the way to go. And that's why um, having put in a temp track for maybe the other reasons that I gave, the love of the demo track becomes a real thing. And then... The music's always done right at the end of the production. So the director and the producers are at a very sensitive point where maybe they don't want to like re- rewrite the feeling of the film by having a completely unexpected score. It does happen. I mean, sometimes the opposite does happen where they've fallen out of love with the demo attempt and they're just saying, Let's fire this composer, get somebody else, and whatever somebody else does will be it. <laughs> it has to be it. Yeah, yeah. And I've worked on a number of films where uh, my composer and I, the composer was the second composer. I think anything will do. They'll love it, whatever it is. It's amazing. And a lot of people don't really know that, that aren't around the business like we are. Yeah. You know? and, and like when I naively first started interviewing composers, and I would ask them about that, and I don't ever ask about that. But I can ask you about that. <laughs> 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 Since you are not a composer. Because we're so discreet. We the are engineers discreet. are so discreet, right? Bopping back to your pop world on my playlist. Yeah. Um, so really nice gentleman that I have interviewed. Great musical integrity, and I think overlooked sometimes. Uh, Toto. Yeah. Uh, you worked on Toto 4, right? Yes. Yeah. It's great sounding strings. Yeah. You know? What do you, uh, remember, what do you remember about that? Um, some good things and lots of good things. <laughs> uh, it was James Newton Howard. Yes. Yeah. And, yes. and, and James, James did that. I, I, 
I can't remember whether it was one day or two days. I remember one very long day. And yeah, it was the London Symphony Orchestra and mm -hmm. uh, David Page mm -hmm. producing in the control room and James had written the arrangements and I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and there it was. <laughs> at the end of the day, at, at the end of the day, um, you have to understand I'm very, very naive and always have been. But at the end of the day, they said, we need to do a rough mix of all these songs. And it was like 10 o'clock at night, and we've just finished with the orchestra. And David Pace somehow got me to try some cocaine <laughs> <laughs> after a symphony orchestra, which I'd never, ever tried. On the Beatles, I had nothing. On all the rest, I, and all right, take one sniff, right? And I thought, I don't know what all the fuss is about. This had absolutely no effect on me at all. So we finished the mixes and I went home and I came back and the next day I had an editing session with a very good friend of mine. And I started taking this quarter inch tape and chopping it up. And this would have been about lunchtime the next day. And then it hit me. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked around and I felt dizzy and I was surrounded by short bits of quarter inch tape on the floor <laughs> all around me. And I said to my producer, I've got no idea what any of this is or what day it is. Um, it had this like delayed effect and I blamed David Page for that <laughs> the rest of my life. <laughs> but no. <laughs> Great story. Yeah, we don't have to put it in. <laughs> no, that's, that, I love, I love that. I love that. <laughs> I love the story. But that, when people, when, you know, you, we talk about Toto <laughs> session, that's the only thing that I remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the record sound, it sounds yeah, right. amazing in, as, uh, in, in retrospect, you know. Yeah. I mean, as, as do many things, really. And again, at the time, you know, Blue Moves, the Elton John record. Oh, I mean, yeah. Which is, sounds, sounds amazing. And I know you worked on that. A number of, it looked like a number of people worked, worked on that record, mm. but you were certainly there for yeah. that project. Yeah, I, you know, in that period, I was the, the go-to guy to, you know, put, I'd kind of figured out how to, make an 80 piece orchestra sound good dynamically and um, EQ and dynamics on top of a rock track because that was quite different from recording it for classical but yeah I, I mean at the time any anybody who was a, a rock star wanted to do this and and I when people say well what what was your like most strange memory of that time and the one that you didn't mention just now, which was as the highlight of maybe my life, was recording, I think, an 80-piece uh, Royal Philharmonic Orchestra with Ozzy Osbourne. Oh. Bark at the, oh, on yes. the Bark of the Moon album. Yes. And it was only a week after he'd like been in all the newspapers for like biting a head. Was it a bat or a chicken? Yeah, some beast. Some, yeah, I think it was a <laughs> bat or a chicken. And Sharon, came, Sharon Osborne came in with all the newspapers, like, look, look, you're in the news again. And, you know, he said that he wanted to sing live with the, with the Royal Philharmonic. So we set up a mic for him and he did it. <laughs> and it's on the album. Yeah. That track's on the album. Yeah. But the idea of, like, even Ozzy wanting to get in on that kind of thing, it was the thing to do. Now the thing to do is games, is music oh, right, for sure. games, mm -hmm. and you're involved in that as well. Yeah. 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 And that's a brave new world, and, you know, the budgets are what the budgets are, and, and you know, they're able to... I mean, it's amazing how that has, has evolved into yeah. a huge sonic outlet. The thing about... Um, that I found very interesting about games was two things. One is the, uh, the composers, in the most part... Not entirely for the most part, uh, and the producers are all completely different crowd to the film crowd. They're usually a lot younger. They're not afraid to take risks. They're not afraid to do in innovative things and do things that are different. And I actually find that if you compare making records and then film scoring and then video game scoring, I actually find video game scoring a step back towards making records because to be 
very general about it. Uh, film scoring, is, I think, mostly is music that you hear that you may not always listen to. A lot of film scores, you think, well, yeah, was there music in that film? And that can be a good thing, you know, because it does the job, but you may not be able to remember it. And video game music is much more like songs and records where people listen to it over and over and over again and they remember it and the fans of of video game scores are um, i think much more they know every note and every and they're, they're much more avid fans than than film it's, that's just my personal opinion nice so uh it, it's a thing that i enjoy doing because um of all those reasons really yeah John Curlander, so it's such great information you've got. We've got some stereophonic questions for you. First is this. Obviously, you came to music at 16 yeah. on, on such an amazing level. Was there an alternate career that you had anticipated doing? Or if you had an alternate career as opposed to being the career that you have, is there another endeavor that, that would have called to you? No, not, not really, except that going back when I was... 16, my father had wanted me to go into um, the fashion business. And I, and I, you know, in England, all these years, we had a huge uh, chain called Marks and Spencers. Sure. And he'd arranged that when I was 18, he was going to get me into, he had contacts to get me into a management thing at Marks and Spencers. So he said, well, go and do this thing at, at EMI Studios. Do it for two years. And then you can, I'll get you into Marks and Spencers. And there were two things against that. One is that I had been born with the maternal gene of colorblindness, red-green colorblind. So that was kind of one point against going into the fashion business, even though all my family had been in the fashion business. And secondly, my father was a huge music fan, uh, particularly um, classical and opera. And after two years, you know, like when... Not only had I worked with the Beatles, but I had worked with some of the giants, assisted with some of the giants of the classical music world that were my father's like idols. You know, he said, you can forget about Marxism, but you don't need to do that. So, yeah, that was his, his idea at the time, but which he folded on very quickly. But no, not, I didn't have any other plans. Marx and Sparks' loss is uh, music, <laughs> yeah. music's gain. Yeah. yeah. John Curlander, who would you consider your mentor in the business? Who, who was really there that you learned from that, that brought you up? Quite a few. I would cite two or three of the engineers at Abbey Road in the early you know, 60s. On the one side, obviously someone like Jeff Amrick, who was very, very helpful. I mean, right after the Abbey Road album, they gave him a chance to uh, produce a Bad Finger album. And Jeff asked me to engineer it for him, in which basically he would teach me. He was learning how to be a producer, and he thought it would be cool for him to teach me how to engineer. So that was cool. And then there was another engineer who now very few people will have heard of, a, a classical engineer called Stuart Elton, who was actually, the interesting thing about Stuart is he had been George Martin's favorite engineer before George had discovered the Beatles. So when George was doing all these comedy records like Mike Mulligan and Peter Sellers, Stuart was George Martin's engineer. But anyway, Stuart taught me how to do classical recording. And he gave me my first job as a classical engineer when I was only I think, 23 or 24. Just go and do this session and do exactly what I tell you to do. And it was the Liverpool Philharmonic up in Liverpool. I wrote down on a little notepad everything he told me to do. And I just, okay, do this and don't vary 1% from it. So I would say those two people at Abbey Road um, were the mentors as such. And I guess, going back to the story about my teacher at school, <laughs> I guess. who only didn't even own up to it. <laughs> if somebody wanted to educate themselves in this world further, what do you tell them to listen to? If somebody wanted to to become an engineer or wanted to move into that that base of knowledge, this is always a difficult question to ask. You you get asked it a, a lot. 
I th I think that the thing is, you know, a lot of times uh, when you're when you're mixing something and you're going over and over again, and you get the feeling, I don't know, I don't know whether I'm getting tired or my ears are, you know, tired of. It doesn't sound right. If you, if you think that, then it's wrong. You know, if you have that instinct that it's wrong, then you really have to say, no, it's wrong. And sometimes you just have to tear the whole thing down and start again. Uh, and also, if, there, if there's something that you're laboring over for two... I mean, a lot of great music is made really quickly. And I would say that if you're at home mixing something and it, it's taking too long and you think you're getting closer to it, you probably not. And sometimes you should just switch off and come back to it fresh another time and see if you can be a bit more spontaneous. John Curlander, what a wealth of information. What great stories you have. Some that, some that will make the edit even. <laughs> <laughs> and some that won't. We really appreciate you coming in and sharing this. And you, thank you for being our guest on Storyophonic. My pleasure. Thank you. You've been listening to Storyophonic, a regular podcast series with tips and tales from deep inside the music industry. We come to you from Datalite Studios in Los Angeles, California. Our show is produced and edited by Lindsay Tomasic. Our production manager is Kim Strand, and our theme music is by Dusty Gray. Please rate us on your favorite podcast platform, catch up with our past episodes, and visit us often for new shows. I'm your host, Dan Kimpel.